everybody. Thank you very much for this new educational workshop, OTS meeting. Um, good morning to the ones who are here in the United States. Good afternoon, people attending us from. So today we are going to have a, another great educational session with a, a lot of people having a lot of experience about some of the most basic things about making oligonucleotides. Uh, we have Mina that will speak us about the chemistry, the new technologies, uh, what are the challenges. We have a presentation from Nito Denko about the method validations. Then Lama will give us a more historical view on the, the oligonucleotide synthesis and some glimpse into some potential future. We will finish last but not least with the uh, Richard Pharmaceuticals about uh, developments. I hope with this uh, new workshop, you have where you can ask your questions and uh, depending on the time and how long each will speak, we will answer a lot of questions in each presentation, but there is a Q&A session at the end. I will try to manage in a way that we can get as much time as possible for this session. And uh, because it's a chat, uh, maybe it will be possible to answer some of also on the chat kind of live. So that uh, we are moment for the oligonucleotide therapeutics industry. We have a, an ever-growing number of approved drugs. We have a number in development in is that is higher than ever and uh, everybody is busy. We see some companies invest in capacity become available year, next year, in two years to help uh, maintain case in the development. Uh, yeah, I think we can be about the situation. Uh, it's a short introduction. And so for people in charge, if you can start Mina's present, recorded presentation now, would be perfect. The sooner we start, the more time we have for the questions. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Oligonucleotide Therapeutic Society meeting 2021. Uh, my name is Mina. I am Vice President of Bioanalytical, DMPK, and Biomarker Development Group at Stoke Therapeutics. Organizers for giving me an opportunity to share with you. The objective of my talk is to uh, give you an overview of the progress the field has made using nucleic acid chemistries for developing therapeutics to address genetic diseases. We will go over the successful examples um, as well as the challenges these technologies are facing as of today. Here is a brief disclaimer. Um, most importantly, the opinions expressed in this presentation are my opinions, and they don't represent opinions or the position of Stoke Therapy. Here is an overview. So I divided this talk into major topics, um, RNA therapeutics and gene ther therapies. Um, within RNA therapeutics, um, the, I will cover the modalities that target messenger RNA, and that includes single-stranded antisense oligonucleotides, and then double-stranded small interfering RNAs. Uh, within antisense oligonucleotides, we'll cover the examples for RNAs H mediated cleavage of messenger RNA, as well as the splice modulation of the RNA. Um, within gene therapies, um, again, gene therapy includes either in, uh, adding a correct copy of the gene or editing the uh, mutated copy of the gene. So uh, within gene editing, we will cover 
uh, ex vivo therapy, which is also called cell therapy, as well as the in vivo gene editing. So endosense oligonucleotides are single-stranded um, sequences, uh, either containing DNA or RNA or a mix of DNA RNA. Um, for RNAs, that mediated mechanism. Um, often it's a, a combination of DNA and RNA sequence. Uh, as shown in the figure, uh, the endosense oligonucleotide must enter the cell and then the nucleus for RNAs its activity. There has been uh, some evidence that RNAs H could be present in cytosol as well, but abundance of RNA is found in the nucleus. So this is one of the requirements for this action of mechanism that ASOs must enter the nucleus. After the antisense oligonucleotide uh, is in the nucleus, it binds to the complementary messenger RNA by watson crick hydrogen bonding, and this heteroduplex is a good substrate for RNAs H. Um, RNAs H cleaves the uh, complementary mRNA, and depending on the binding affinity of the antisense oligonucleotide with the remaining pieces of mRNA, it could be released back to act on to the another copy of messenger RNA. In that case, the, the catalytic activity of that ASO would be higher. Um, so as of now, uh, we have four antisense oligonucleotides approved based on this mechanism. The very first molecule um, was approved in 1998 for the treatment of um, cytomegalus uh, virus retinitis. And the, in that sequence, we had that time not learned the significance of two prime modifications. Uh, this sequence was only with DNA and phosphothiolate chemistry. The version of the chemistry was applied for mepomersin, inotersin, and volansorsin. Uh, for these drugs, the target is in liver, and the sequence contains 2 prime methoxyethyl uh, modified um, where the DNA is in the core. So successfully, the antisense oligonucleotides have been administered in eye and in liver. So here is the second category of antisense oligonucleotides. They work by splice modulation, and they have been used to target loss of function diseases. Um, an ex example here is um, of a, a DMD patient where exon 52 is deleted, and how the skipping of exon 51 can, can rescue the protein. Um, as you can see here, uh, in case of the deletion of the 52 exon, the, after splicing, the RNA is not uh, in frame. And because of that, there is no formation of protein. Uh, after the engagement with the antisense oligonucleotide on the exon 51, which leads to the skipping of 51, after splicing, now the protein does not have two exons, but it is in frame. So the resulting protein is not full protein, uh, but it is enough to uh, rescue uh, some of the functions of the muscles. So the phenotype of these patients will be like Becker muscular dystrophy. And based on, uh, there have been uh, three approved drugs in DMD, targeting exon 53, targeting exon 51. Um, the splice modulation has also been used uh, for CNS diseases like um, uh, SMA, which is spinal muscular atrophy. Nusinusin was approved in 2016, where the target is in spinal cord, and the route of administration was intrathecal. I also want to share with you the mechanism of STK01 and oligonucleotides being developed by Stoke Therapeutics for the treatment of Dravet syndrome. Uh, Dravet syndrome is a haploinsufficient uh, disease um, caused by loss of function mutations in SCN1A gene. Um, that leads to uh, nearly 50% of the protein, a sodium channel protein in brain uh, compared to the healthy people. Um, we identified uh, NMD uh, e event in SCN1 gene that leads to uh, formation of a non-productive RNA. Now this event is present in the a copy of where we have loss of function mutations as well as the healthy copy. So it is the engagement of the oligonucleotide with the healthy copy where um, exclusion of this NMD exon leads to the formation of a productive RNA. So as you can see here, 
inclusion of the NMD exon uh, leads to uh, non-productive messenger RNA, which does not form protein. But after we engage the STKO1 on this NMD exon, that leads to the skipping, that leads to productive messenger RNA and formation of the protein. Um, so STKO1 is an 18 monoligonucleotide that has 2 prime methoxyethylene phosphothiurate modifications. It can prevent uh, the inclusion of NMD exon or the skipping of this exon uh, by working on the wild type copy to produce product. Um, it's important to note that uh, this mechanism is indifferent to the mutations because we are rescuing this function from uh, wild type copy and it's intended to restore the sodium channel which is insufficient uh, in the patient. So here's the second category of RNA therapeutics, uh, which is small interfering RNA. This is a double-stranded RNA uh, consisting of antisense and sense strand. Um, after the SI is the cell, it gets loaded into a um, risk complex where the next step is the dissociation of the sense strand. Uh, and then risk loaded with the antisense strand um, engages the messenger RNA, which leads to the cleavage of messenger RNA. And the complex of risk with the antisense strand is ready to uh, bind with the next copy of messenger RNA. The catalytic activity of risk complex, it seems, is, is very high. Now, the major difference for uh, cytofaction for siRNA versus antisense oligonucleotide, again, is uh, where uh, this cleavage is occurring, and then it is in cytosol for siRNA versus nucleus for antisense oligonucleotides. Um, as of now, um, drugs based on this mechanism, all four of them are in liver. Uh, the very first approval was uh, for patisiran, where uh, it, the, the delivery vehicle is uh, lipid nano. And the other three molecules, um, the delivery is done by conjugation with galnac. There are two more molecules uh, which are in late stage of development, that's rotriceran and phytoceran. Uh, again, the target for all these molecules. The um, and the challenges. Now, uh, as we have plenty of examples uh, of approved sense molecules with different mechanisms, as well as an siRNA. So now we have uh, established chemical modifications that can provide metabolic stability to these molecules, target affinity, as well as the cell uptake. Manufacturing processes for these modalities are well uh, optimized. Uh, we also know very adequately what are from these modalities. There is a low risk of immunogenicity, and also the field has to minimize the off-target effects by using uh, various chemistries. Thousands have been dosed safely with both antisense oligonucleotide RNAs for guidance, even though these molecules are molecules for approval purposes, uh, regulatory guidance increasing specifically for these modalities um, and for the delivery it has been very very efficient in terms of challenges uh, we think extra hepatitis still needs work for both uh, ASO and RNA success in muscles chemistries that are in muscles are diamidate morpholino chemistries um, and the dry suppression these are the two develops uh, which were uh, based on the modifications they had. Um, Intrathecal and administration are the only ways to reach brain or eye, uh, respectively, and both these procedures and cannot be used frequently. Uh, so we do need more chemistry effort with the tissues uh, which are extra hepatic. Um, those uh, issues addressed by either uh, finding another uh, galnac um, for these tissues uh, or some penetrating peptides, lipids, and antibodies. Um, RNA therapies, ther therapies also note that they uh, need to be given chronically over the lifetime of the, um, you know, and that causes significant financial and logistical burden to.
um, in addition, needed um, uh, specifically for IVT or IT injection can cause um, the risk of infection uh, or other side effects in these patients. So these RNA therapeutics, they still exist. Now I want to bring a gene delivery uh, into picture. And uh, were, it was very exciting to see in 2019, the very first drug uh, approved for uh, SMA based on gene delivery. Um, again, these, uh, these patients, they have a defective SM, uh, SMN1 gene. And um, in these patients, um, the uh, Jelzenzma, which is actually an AAV9 vector with the SMA gene, uh, is introduced and to restore the function of this, uh, this protein. Um, and this drug was administered by intravenous. Um, the drug has been approved for children under two years of age. And this is a one-time therapy, $2 million. Now I want to just bring back our Nussi Nursen again uh, for comparison that this was an antisensal ibonucleotide working by splice modulation where um, the, uh, the exon 7 inclusion uh, is important to productive messenger RNA leading to uh, a productive protein. So these two um, technologies work by very different mechanisms. But the outcome, as you see for a patient, it's very how much burden uh, these two um, therapies can be. Uh, supposed to be a one-time therapy versus nosinersen is going to be a lifetime uh, therapy. Um, and the cost for nosinersen for the first year was $750,000, followed $50,000 for all the years throughout the life of the patient. So. Um, I think in a way, at least the patients have option uh, to, to choose sensor oligonucleotide or, or gene delivery. Now, before I um, talk about the second category of gene therapy, which is gene editing, I want to take a moment to describe the core of gene editing, which is the double-stranded breaks. So double-stranded breaks in DNA occur naturally, um, or they can also occur uh, in the presence of some stimulants like chemicals, but not homology directed with the help of the sister chromatid to repair those necks. Um, non homologous end joining uh, happens when actually a, a different part of the DNA gets incorporated into these necks, or sometimes a small portion of the DNA gets deleted as a result of the, this mechanism. Now, it is uh, this uh, non homologous end joining mechanism, which has been utilized to activate the gene or insert another portion of the gene into the, of the cell. The core and, and cleavage of the mix in the DNA in the mammalian cells is not easy. So, uh, there, a lot of effort has been put in to actually discover the nucleases that can give efficient provide efficient cleavage in mammalian cells. And two of those are the zinc finger and the transcription activator like effector nucleus, um, they, which have been used to routinely. Uh, the CRISPR-Cas nucleus, recovery of this um, uh, enzyme has been revolutionary in the science of gene editing. The system comprises one is the single strand Second is the Cas9 endonucleus. Um, the guide RNA contains 20 base pair that is complementary to the target where the neck needs to happen. But more, more importantly, there has to be uh, a complementary PAM sequence on the DNA, uh, which actually helps in positioning the guide strand at that position. Uh, that, that region is PAM. Gene editing has been successfully used to develop uh, chimeric antigen receptor T cells, where the T cells from the patients can be modified genetically um, to express the receptors on the surface of the cells, uh, which precisely bind to the antigens and uh, destroy them. Uh, this technology is called ex vivo. So thanks to the discovery of CRISPR that now we can think of um, developing treatments for otherwise untreatable diseases. Uh, for example, beta thalassemia, 
uh, which is uh, caused by deficit of a beta globin protein. Um, it's caused by uh, uh, more than 200 point mutations. There are uh, generally three categories uh, of thalassemia, but the major one is where two defective genes are there, and that leads to absolute no production of beta globin. And these individuals, uh, they require very frequent blood transfusions throughout their life. Now, Vertex Therapeutics is developing uh, a treatment for uh, beta thalassemia um, um, by uh, inactivating BCL11A gene. So BCL11A gene represses um, actually the formation of fetal hemoglobin, uh, which is why in the first few years of our life, um, when uh, we, uh, we stop producing the fetal hemoglobin. And uh, Vertex is using um, a CTX001, um, which is again a gene editing uh, therapy, creating BCL11A so that uh, these patients can start producing beta globin. The same molecule is also being used uh, to treat the sickle cell anemia. Uh, so these uh, two molecules right now are in development. Um, thanks to again gene editing, uh, that this year fourth CAR T cell therapy was approved by FDA. Um, the, and this is the fourth uh, in CAR T, but this is the a third one of lymphoma. Um, earlier, there were two treatments, uh, which is the Ascarda and Chemorrhea, developed for lymphoma. And uh, uh, now uh, BMS has a third drug fighting uh, for lymphoma. Other than that, uh, the, the other CAR T drug that was approved recently was the and, and that is developed for the treatment of cytokine release syndrome. So for gene delivery itself or gene editing, um, either a viral or the non-viral uh, categories have been used to deliver those components. Um, within virus, it is AAV, lentivirus, or adenovirus, um, adeno-associated virus. And uh, for non-viral category, although um, one, one can use lipids, polymers, uh, microinjection type of technologies or electroporation. But in clinic, uh, the successful examples have been seen either by the uh, lipids or the LMPs or the polymers. The other technologies uh, have been used uh, ex vivo um, or in, in vitro. Now, having gone through um, sRNA, antisense, as well as the gene editing technologies, I wanted to put out one example there where all these efforts have been put in um, for uh, patients with the transthyretine amyloidosis. Right now, we have uh, two drugs that have been approved and two which are in development, and the mechanism of action is different uh, here. So, apatisiran and butyrisiran, the mechanism of action is same, but the delivery cycle is different. Uh, butyrisiran uh, is delivered by LNP. Butyrisiran is an sRNA uh, galenic conjugate, which is in phase three. Uh, Inotersin is an antisense oligonucleotide uh, approved already. And now, Intelia is in clinical phase for developing uh, gene therapy for this disease. Um, and, and this is the very first uh, gene therapy which is, um, which is being used in vivo. So the field is very, very excited uh, to see the results. Um, but I think I wanted to put it out there also how these uh, different mechanisms of actions, they lead to uh, a different product profile. Uh, Pertisiran is uh, every um, three weeks frequency. Uh, what is ran is every three months frequency in a thurson, which is an antisense and is not using a, a conjugation strategy is every weak frequency. And in Talia a molecule, if it's successful, uh, this will be one-time therapy. Um, people have also been trying to use the gene editing tool uh, to not just silence the genes, but also address single point mutations. And, and one example is here where people are attempting to use the CRISPR-Cas to deliver um, and deaminase enzyme to go and, and make the changes in uh, single base. Uh, for example, cytidine that gets converted to uridine, which later on by um, endogenous mismatch pair and the DNA replication will lead to the change in the base pair. Again, it's very early on for these technologies, but again, CRISPR-Cas has assisted to make the progress faster for these technologies. Um, lastly, I just wanted to again uh, share uh, what my opinion is about 
you know, where we are with these gene therapies and what are the challenges. Now, again, I personally believe that, you know, the chemical modifications and the work we did in SRNA field for LNPs, that certainly accelerated the development. Processes, uh, they are uh, advancing to make LNPs as well as the modified capsids. Um, a few ex vivo cell therapies are already approved, um, and, and there is an approved therapy for gene delivery as well. Uh, regulatory guidances for gene therapy and cell therapy is increasing. Uh, proof of concept for in vivo gene editing is in clinic. Um, there is a, a proof of concept in vivo uh, for the cell delivery to brain cells as well by IC. Uh, this work has been shown by uh, encoded therapeutics for the introduction of SCN1A gene in the brain of animals um, via AAV delivery. The challenges I see in gene therapy is um, that are, they're still there. Uh, one is the packaging of the large genes. Um, that's, that's challenging for the vectors. Um, development of bioidentical assays to monitor the PK of the gene and the mRNA and all those machinery that is going into the cells. Um, we, we still need to speed up the techniques uh, for monitoring those components. Uh, manufacturing is not urgent. Uh, CMC guidelines are urgent for uh, these biologics compared to these molecules. The of Cas9 protein vectors, the new proteins target um, editing that needs to be assessed at and the follow up time to 15 years is required in clinical trials. Uh, safety concerns, especially with genetically modified hematopoietic cells, because they are going to uh, in the patient, so that concern is there. Uh, this is not a conventional biologic. This is totally an uncharted territory. So I think we, we need to um, establish uh, all those safety measures for these biologics. Um, in summary, uh, targeting RNA is a very viable approach. Um, Compared to the small molecule drugs, they last longer in the patients, and but they still um, used throughout the life of the patient. Um, I, I believe that the success, what we uh, or the developments we made in uh, development of the RNA medicines, that they paved the path for the gene therapies. Um, gene therapies involve either the transfer of genetic material, editing of the gene. Either way, they are they are meant to uh, alleviate the cause of the disease uh, with one-time therapy. The discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 revolutionized the the gene therapy field. It's estimated that by 2025, uh, US FDA will be approving 10 to 20 a year. A primary obstacle for broader application of the gene therapy is the continued response. Uh, as well as the products of the foreign transgenes, because the body is not uh, body has not seen those proteins before, and the RNA targeting technologies they allow for uh, transient and reversible modifications of gene expression. That's one advantage. While gene therapy lead to the permanent change of the genome, so therefore requiring much more longer uh, follow up of these patients for safety is required. Um, I am so thrilled to share my opinions with like to hear uh, if you guys have any any questions about this topic thank you very much well bye bye thank you very much for this presentation mina very interesting and uh, very covering almost everything at this time we have one question uh, that is about the selection, the design, and uh, uh, the selection of a of a new ASO for going into the. And uh, Christopher, if you are aware of any kind of a best-in-class ASO design tool or arg algorithm that could be for people starting something, also something that. Uh, Richard Geary will address later in the development, but uh, what is your experience ASO or even siRNA selection? How to do that best? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, and I think time for someone to compile everything and write a good review. Um, this information 
higher in applications, but it's all over the place. Um, for example, we have learned that you know you need at least a 16 mer length to reduce the off-target based um, off-target based side effects. Right? We can't have contiguous uh, you know more than three trees in a sequence. So likewise, I think that I have been various lessons learned. Um, uh, similarly, how to reduce the CPG immune stimulation by modifying um, two prime uh, position of the nucleosides. But um, I think this information is all over the place. I'm happy to forward some publications to you and talk to me, but I can't locate a, a single review covering the algorithms for siRNA or nucleosides. Thank you very much, Mina. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it's now time at 10.30 to move to the next presentation. That is the presentation by Heidi Heck from Nitodenk about method valid for oligonucleotides and raw materials. Good morning. My name is Heidi Heck, and I am the Director of Analytical Development at Nitto Avisha. Nitto Avisha is a manufacturer of oligonucleotides with facilities based in Milford, Massachusetts, Marlboro, Massachusetts, and Cincinnati, Ohio. We have a sister company, Nitto Avisha Pharma Services, located in Irvine, California. My group is responsible for method development through validation of all methods supporting oligonucleotide manufacturing. I'd like to thank the organizers of the OTS conference for inviting me to speak today. My topic is the method validation approaches for oligonucleotides and raw materials. Our agenda will discuss the validation strategy we employ at Avisha, as well as several validation case studies. Analytical method validation is quite a broad and deep topic. For this reason, we recommend consulting regulatory guidance documentation, such as ICH Q2 and USP 1225, to help guide your regulatory validation strategy. Start by defining the method's purpose and scope of intended usage. What kind of method do you have? Is it for identification? Is it a stability indicating method for purity and impurity profiling? Do you have a quantitative assay or a limit test? You'll also want to identify the scope of use. What materials are you testing? Is it a raw material? Is it for in-process testing? Or is it a final drug substance or formulated drug product? Answering these questions will also determine the type of performance elements that are needed to ensure that your method is suitable for its intended use. Start by establishing the targets. Using an analytical target profile, you can define the performance criteria for your method. As the method progresses through development, qualification may be needed. This is performed typically under a protocol with acceptance criteria in a manner similar to a validation, but prior to a full validation of the method. The idea is to ensure that you obtain data that informs the validation. There should be no surprises. Why should we validate a method? We're actually validating the results that a method will produce. Some preconditions to validation. Development data should be available that support the validation exercise. You should not be surprised at the results obtained under validation. It should instead be a confirmation of what you already know. The method should have system suitability testing already included. This encompasses the known performance of certified reference materials under the method conditions. The test method should be approved by the quality unit. 
as should the validation protocols. The protocols must include predefined acceptance criteria for the performance results. The instrumentation should be fully qualified or calibrated as needed. Personnel conducting validation testing must also be trained. The validation is, ex is executed in accordance with good documentation practices. And finally, the validation reports should include all the data as well as any deviations. A number of analytical approaches are used at Avisha for testing of raw materials through drug substance and drug product. The most common technique is HPLC or liquid chromatography. It is typically coupled to a UV or ultraviolet detector and often with mass spectrometry as well. The first case study involves identification of a raw material by LCMS. Two prime fluoro base loaded CPG or controlled pore glass solid support is a critical material for the process because it forms the first link in the oligonucleotide chain. In order to identify the material, we first need to cleave the base off of the support using a hydrolysis reaction. We inject liquid onto the chromatograph and obtain a UV profile at 260 nanometers where the main component is easily observed, which is supported by the total ion current as it enters the mass spectrometer and fragments to give characteristic ions for the base as well as fragmentation products and also a dimer is observed. The validation of this method hinges on the specificity. Specificity is outlined in yellow because that is one of the key parameters recommended for a validation of an ID method according to ICH as well as USP. At Avisha, we also included the precision and solution stability under validation. Hydrochloric acid is a non-critical reagent used in the synthesis of oligonucleotides. Its assay content was analyzed by acid-base titration. This is a USP compendial procedure, and thus the validation falls under the guidance for USP verification. Avisha performed testing in 2011 to assess specificity, precision, and accuracy to passing results. The guidance changed in 2019 to recommend a long-term solution stability of greater than 24 hours. Avisha examined our methodology in compliance to this standard. The test did fall under USP 1226 to be a basic compendial procedure where is not required. Method number three looks at the purity of a raw material. We're using GC with flame ionization detection in direct injection mode to assess the purity of this non-critical uh, material. Actually two materials, acetic anhydride and triethylamine. If you look at elements, we did six different performance areas all in yellow because the quantitative impurity test recommendations from ICH are extensive. For this type of method, you really need to ensure that you have both specificity as well as precision and accuracy of your method across a linear range. In this case, from the limit of quantitation, which was established using uh, signal to noise criteria and also precision, all the way to 150% of nominal. 
This is a typical range for a quantitative impurity test. The final raw material method looks at the identification impurity of a 2 prime fluorophosphoramidite, which is a critical material, and it is analyzed by LCUV mass spec. It is a quantitative impurity test, which is stability indicating, and therefore has a number of required elements, from specificity through limit of quantitation and linearity and range. These elements were confirmed under validation in the range of LOQ to 200% of the nominal concentration. The additional information on this method shows that the chromatography reveals a diastereometric pair for the in this case a 2 prime fluorouridine is shown. Two other known impurities have been spiked to demonstrate activity. The responses were plotted at low levels, and the LOD and LOQ have correspondingly been identified at 0.001% 0.003% of nominal, indicating excellent response. Let's take a closer look at the solution stability, which is performed up to seven days under a variety of conditions. The stability of the solution was examined over seven days under ambient and 2 to 8 degrees Celsius. The traces were compared with the T0 represented in blue, and it shows that no additional impurities were formed and the area counts of the main components remained stable under all conditions. In the bottom trace, the 80 degree sample clearly produced additional degradation peaks that were resolved from the main components. This supported the specificity assessment. Even straightforward tests such as pH are subject to validation for later phase development work. In this case, a pegylated oligonucleotide is examined for the pH of its solution with a calibrated pH meter. The material falls under, again, a USP verification, but with a more extensive look at the performance of the method from specificity through accuracy. Measurements were taken at a specified controlled temperature of 24 degrees, and the pH was verified using a reference material for its accuracy and precision. Samples were prepared and run, and the precision, as well as accuracy against the expected C of A value, were compared. The water content of an oligonucleotide duplex was evaluated using Carl Fisher coulometric titration in the oven mode. The key validation elements included specificity, linearity, and range, as well as precision, accuracy, and sample stability. This material to a drying step generate be spiked with no water in the range of 2% to 25%. These results were plotted and the linear regression analysis demonstrated that the response was linear, precise, and accurate across the range. The robustness of the was also evaluated at plus or minus 5 degrees from the nominal setting of 100 degrees C. The variance of not more than 2% was met. This method is considered validated for later phase product specific use. A Galnac RNA duplex drug substance is denatured using anion exchange chromatography to assess its purity and impurities. Validation elements of a complex quantitative impurity method are quite extensive and are shown in yellow in the table herein. 
diagrams of a crude sample to demonstrate that the method maintains specificity under these conditions. This kind of a messy sample is used during the validation to ensure that the method is all intended usage. So don't forget that methods for drug substance, if they're used for intermediate testing, should be validated for that purpose as well. Another example of impurity is using ion pair reverse phase mode. This method includes identification as well as purity and impurity profiling of a GALNAC RNA dupe. It is examining the drug product as well as in process. The validation elements for a quantitative impurity test are outlined in yellow and are, again, comprehensive. In this example shown of chromatography, the duplex is spiked with 5% of known impurities. Again, this demonstrates the specificity by examining the resolution of impurity components, the lack of appearances. And in this uh, validation, we also examine the four stages under acid, base, oxidative conditions, as well as temperature and of the solid and solution. This kind of analysis ensures that we have all potential scenarios wherein impurities could form to the method is stability indicating. Size exclusion chromatography was used for the non-denaturing analysis of an RNA duplex. The identification, purity, and assay were determined for substance, drug product, and for in-process samples. For quantitative impurity methods such as this, multiple validation elements are required. To those highlighted in yellow, process was a multivariate that multiple phase A buffer concentration, the column temperature, and the flow rate to assess their impact on the resolution. This is an example of a method that changes over time. The validation was performed in 2015, and the report was revised in 2016 with clarity. Two years later, the LOD and LOQ single-strand component. The scope of the method changed significantly with the addition of a quantitative assay. This required a re of the method for that use in 20. In conclusion, the analytical method validation is a progression of the method development life cycle. The life cycle includes early stage development through method transfer and the end user experience with the method to monitor its performance over time. Specifications, process information, and regulatory expectations do change. The methods and their supporting documentation must therefore adapt to those changes. Building a solid foundation of performance data informs a more successful method execution. I'd like to acknowledge the many of the Avisha Analytical Development and Quality Control staff, and thank you for your attention today. Thank you, Heidi. Um, it was a great, uh, a lot of very helpful information. Uh, we don't have much time for question right now, but we have the Q&A later. There is a question in the chat. So we will move to Masat's presentation that is live and uh, we will come back with some questions later. Thank you.
Masad, it's up to you. everyone or good to those who are in the uh, east uh, I'm, uh, here in Montreal and actually uh, live and I want to thank uh, Mark for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, to you this morning uh, when he uh, asked me to cover a lecture on the legal nucleotide synthesis uh, I and the title of the workshop being uh, the basics uh, I thought that, uh, the newcomers uh, in the area and those who for a while, an overview of how we got to where we are today in terms of the chemistry that was developed uh, to be able to see the nucleotides today in the way that we do. Uh, uh, and so, um, as you know, this is probably the most exciting times uh, feel nucleic acid chemistry and biology, which of course has been driven by fundamental made uh, in and we have been exploiting, of course, uh, each of these knowledge of uh, biology, uh, probing these different qualities of legal nucleotides. So this, this discovery is important, but it's the ability to be able to synthesize legal nucleotides in a rapid way and then to uh, uh, look at this mechanism of actions in a much more detail. Of course, we keep track of the fact that they are powerful oligonucleotides, not only in principle, but now that has been realized by the uh, of an approval of several oligonucleotides out there. Uh, so this is what I'm going to do uh, this morning. And, um, and basically, I'm going to start from the beginning, uh, 66 years ago, and then move very quickly in how things point that we're now being able to synthesize oligonucleotides in a kilogram uh, scale, which is just. And then some future outlook and some recent developments that we should maybe keep in mind as we go to the next uh, in, this, in this area. So let's go back to 1955, right? Many of us were, had not been born. Uh, so Todd uh, was the first to report the use of phosphate triester uh, dinucleoside phosphate uh, synthesis. And, uh, and actually that was quite an accomplishment. He took one gram of thymidine uh, phosphorylated sugar three prime phosphate activate chlorosuccinamide to give this active form to form a phosphate intermediate. Um, remarkable, of course, is the fact that uh, he was able to get this group 1.2 grams of the dimer, which is about half a, you know, a gram of which uh, was the desired nucleotide. Um, uh, you notice that you know, it was a slow process. It take hours, uh, it was tedious. And in fact, if you look at how they were able to deprotect the dinucleotide, they had to use an acid with quite a bit of time, nitric acid, which is of course not optimal, but that was what's required in this particular step. And so, and the triester was not isolated. It was only after it was uh, neutralized and purified that was able to characterize it. Um, so the conclusion at that time is that maybe phosphotriesters are not stable because the benzyl protecting group was found not to be you know, easy to handle. And this will influence the way the chemists would now approach the synthesis for about the next 10 years. And of course, uh, uh, we, we all know about Govin Corana, a pioneer uh, in the area of oligonucleotide synthesis. And he says, well, why buy? a protecting group, why don't we just stick to the phosphodiesters and we can, in the presence of a condensing reagent, 
team was known for PEP. We would implement that into the synthesis. Uh, a, a key contribution of his lab was the development of protecting groups of the purines uh, bases and the protecting groups. And so allowing only the desired condensation to take place. And then the oligonucleotide from the three prime end, so going to the three prime direction, Nature actually does it. We know today we do it in the opposite direction when we are by chemistry, for example. And uh, he was able in his group to synthesize uh, pentadecan nucleotides, 15 nucleotides. They were complementary to each other. They have which you would then add, uh, anneal with another 15 nucleotide uh, duplex DNA ligase. Um, and ATP as the cofactor was able to and make longer gene fragments. Quite an accomplishment um, in the late 1970s. In 1972, his group reported the first gene synthesis uh, of a semi long uh, uh, duplex with a sequence to the yeast alanine transfer RNA. And it took over three years to do this. And then when it was it occupied the entire issue of the Journal of Biology, 283 pages dedicated to that synthesis. So quite an accomplishment. Um, in fact, one of the big legacies too is that even today, in protecting groups, uh, and we call them the necessary evil, we need to put them in there, trans remove them at the end. We're still using some of these. And of course, the, the tridal groups and the different type of tridal groups introduced by Corana. And that remains today, even after uh, close to limitations. You could see this low coupling yields, uh, very long coupling uh, reaction time. As the molecule was getting longer, it was very tedious to purify because you were dealing with charge uh, phosphodiesters, so you had to use an ion uh, chromatin. And also, as the chains grew, it was more difficult to get them solubilized in the solvent so that you could do the coupling. Uh, but we learned a lot from this. And then in 1960, Professor Letzinger and a graduate by the name of Kelvin Ole decided to go back to the approach. They were married because you were a neutral molecule that in principle, if you chose the protecting group here carefully, would allow you to do silica gel column chromatography, for example, and do large scale uh, synthesis of these. And so that was the idea is to come back, but now use a different set of protection on the phosphate. They use the cyanoethyl groups and others, uh, but here is the case where they were able to make uh, for example, trinucleotides, um, and were able to, 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 to do them in a large scale. Um, Kelvin Ogilvy, a graduate student at that time in Lesnar's lab, I guess wanted to really show that the triester had merits. And so he took pretty much the entire supply in Bob Lesnar's lab of thymidine, took the 36 gram of thymidine, triangulated it, and then did the phosphorylation coupling and to get the uh, dinucleoside uh, phosphate triester, which he was able to put on, load on a silica gel column and get in close to 40 grams uh, of, of this mixture, the majority of which was the desired three prime, five prime link dimer. So that really demonstrated the triesters, un unlike what people thought before, were actually pretty stable molecules and that you could exploit this strategy to construct oligonucleotides. And they went on to make trimers and pentamers uh, and uh, successfully, um, they were uh, also able to uh, use what we call orthogonal protecting groups. So for example, once you made this dimer, you could remove this protecting group and then phosphorylate to produce this dimer here or you could choose to remove the monomethoxy triadyl group to get the five prime hydroxyl and couple this dimer with this dimer to get your tetramer. 
And actually the yields were pretty decent. If you're thinking about this being done in solution, uh, but note the coupling at times, they're still required sometimes to do this. And they were able to do three plus three to get hexamers. And this idea of block condensation, I think is gonna be important as I will tell you in a moment, if we wanna think about solution phase chemistry to synthesize large amounts of oligonucleotides. Um, there were others in the field looking at triester chemistry. And in fact, I have no time to go over all the different people and pioneers, but you would probably recognize this name, Fritz Eckstein, who was also looking at the triester approach using different protecting groups on the phosphate. And Colin Rees, of course, a major force as well in England uh, in developing methods for both DNA and RNA. And they were able to report uh, these uh, uh, papers where they were able to make very long uh, deoxyoligonucleotides. Um, all right, and now the break, big breakthrough, okay. 19, Letzinger strikes again. Now it was to use phosphorus three chemistry, phosphite triesters. And what we learned immediately is that we had to wait out coupling reaction to, to couple two units. Uh, we were talking about 10 minutes uh, for the phosphorylation using this dichlorodite uh, reagents, five minutes, and look how mild this is. They had to pull this down to minus 78 because of the high reactivity of the uh, And then another step that we should recognize is the realization that you could take phosphide triesters and oxidize and five minutes to the desired ester. And they were able to synthesize uh, uh, short chains uh, this way. Now this tells us we should be able to assess much more rapidly. Uh, and uh, another very important development by Bob Lessinger and of course Bruce Merrifield is the uh, uh, that you could do a coupling reactions on the surface of an insoluble polymer support, which is now the standard way to grow oligonucleotides on the surface of, uh, in those days, polystyrene, for example. And after the coupling reaction will take place to get the dimer, you will off the insoluble support and your dimer would be bound, ready to react with a third unit to and start growing the oligonucleotide until you decide that you want to cleave it. This was major, major, of course, discovery. And in fact, I feel that both Lessinger should have also been recognized with chemistry in order to Bruce Berry field back then. And in fact, if you look at the literature, uh, Bob Lessinger was actually already doing immobilization with small molecules, ephedrine, corn uh, uh, supports, which were polystyrenes. Uh, and, and so that's, a, that's another lecture for another, for another day, but wonderful work. And to celebrate uh, Bob Letzinger, the audience has a special uh, on Tuesday noon at 2.15, chaired by Manohara and myself, where we're going to hear a alumni and, uh, who work with Bob Letzinger who were able to students as well as Bob Lessinger's son will be there joining us. The wonderful person that Bob was not only as a scientist, but also, so I encourage you to, to attend to this. Quickly, people recognize the potential of the phosphide triester chemistry, the chlorophosphide triester chemistry and uh, Mark Rob. Uh, Michael Smith were exploiting this to make PCR probes. In fact, Ogilvy and Mona Nemer were also trying to adapt the chlorophosphite to synthesize oligonucleotides. And that led to, in fact, one of the first synthesizers, if not the first chlorophosphite triester approach, Bob Lessinger uh, gave as a gift to our field. And so here you have the young Ogilvy back in the 80s and the two associates constructing a synthesizer exploiting the chlorophosphite triester approach that Bob Letzinger had introduced. And you notice this prototype 
is on top of a because they were the gene machine inside the freezer since Bob Letzinger chemistry seemed to work better at cold temperatures, then eventually recognized that room temperature was actually uh, okay. So this was great that the field was moving forward with development in oligonucleotide synthesis. And that wonderful change of the chlorine to the aminos by Serge Bocash and Mark Carruthers to give us this wonderful phosphoramidase that we've actually come to love now and use today in automated solid phase synthesis. It was now possible to be able to chromatogram these phosphoramidase you couldn't do it with the chlorophosphites. And they would enjoy of the same fast coupling reactions that we would see with the chlorophosphites. And the kinetics of the coupling was just higher and the yields uh, could be pushed to nearly quantitative yields by using an excess of the monomer relative to the growing oligonucleotide chain. Major uh, development uh, in our at the same time, Kelvin Ogilvy and his graduate students at McGill University, recognizing the power of the phosphoramidite chemistry, were able to adapt that to two prime silo protected RNA monomers, which is in fact is still the standard monomers if you want to synthesize. And back in 1988, they reported the synthesis of a transfer RNA that had the ability to do amino acyl uh, 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 peptide uh, bond formation, uh, demonstrating the power of chemical synthesis because now you could synthesize RNA long enough and then incorporate chemical modifications that you could only do at that time uh, through the chemical process. Okay. Uh, and if you've been following the field, um, I was amazed of the work, of course, that going on at, for example, Ionis Pharmaceuticals over the year in trying to ease the scale of synthesis of oligonucleotides. And so I was just amazed to see this is actually a column uh, to do a 1.4 mole synthesis of a which is equivalent to 8.8 .8 kilograms of, of oligonucleotides phase flow through technology, uh, which is main there as we're trying to synthesize oligonucleotides. Um, but if you really care about um, finding complementary uh, methods that would allow you to junction with solid phase, you may want to also consider going back to the synthesis. And I do opportunity for solution phase synthesis to go to even larger scales. But of course, now we have to worry about chromatography, et cetera. Uh, one of the things about solid phase synthesis in the large scale is, of course, the high consumption of solvents and is the management waste cost, of course, that has to come into mind when you're doing this uh, law. Ideally, you will not go to batches, reduce the solvent footprint, and if you could, then as you increase this, costs are going to go down. So I, I believe that solution phase chemistry and some new opportunities coming from mechanochemistry allow us to discover new ways to get to large scale synthesis. But there is work to do over there. Um, so our group, for example, has been um, looking at mechanochemistry, which is basically uh, reactions. Um, that are uh, and you can input in mechanical energy, such as grinding, for example, uh, uh, or using a mix of gold mills uh, to do the actual uh, uh, energy to do the cup. And so our host of the OTS uh, uh, conference, Dan O'Reilly, we hear a lot of uh, 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 was one of the first, in fact, to use uh, phosphoramidite chemistry to demonstrate that you can put these solids, uh, put a steel ball in there, and shake this chamber to be able to uh, couple this in the absence of solvent. Very good efficiencies with a 
cartography, and I'll get this uh, to this in a moment. Um, sulfur, elemental sulfur, which was back uh, in the 80s to bioase, was abandoned because this would clog your gene machine, right? But using uh, mechanochemistry, there is no problem of, of this. And of course, you can use many other sulfur transfer reagents to do the same, but the reaction actually works very well. We were surprised of how well these reactions were happening in the absence of solvent. And I'm willing to say that we may end up looking at reactions that we may not have seen in solution that would be accessible through mechanochemistry. James Thorpe, later this afternoon in the early career researchers, will give you an update on the work that we're doing on mechanochemistry, where he's now using phosphonate chemistry, which was championed by Starwinsky. And of course, a lot of work came from C.B. Rees, uh, where he's demonstrating this particular case, and this was published just uh, last year, that in a single shaken milling process, you can activate the phosphonate, you can do the sulfur transfer to the intermediate. And under these conditions, the travel group actually came off. So you were able to get this trimer in a single milling process in 65% yield. So I really think there are things there that we need to really look as we're trying to make blocks of oligonucleotides that we could then use uh, to do block uh, couplings. And so here is just the phosphorus NMR to indicate that what you get here is a mixture of uh, uh, four diastereoisomers, each one having two phosphorus signals. So you see a total of, of eight. Um, but you have to use chromatography. And so it'd be nice to be able to avoid the chromatography if you could use soluble uh, tags, ionic tags, like imidazolinium or phosphonium tags that allows you to crash the uh, intermediates of oligonucleotides uh, right after coupling without having to do uh, chromatography. And so back uh, already uh, many years ago, we demonstrated that you could actually grow up to 10 MERS being the limit in a stepwise process, never doing any chromatography, only precipitating the intermediate oligonucleotide after every step in a non-polar uh, solvent and then deprotecting only at the end. And this would show you, for example, the synthesis of a pentamer that had not been purified by chromatography. This is the crude product that was deprotected, injected into HDLC, and you can actually see very good purity. The limit seems to be about 10 because now you start getting solubility issues, but there are ways to, to, to come um, um, to overcome this. And of course, uh, Jimenez, Molina, and Lomber have come up with other very nice soluble supports that allow you to do exactly the same thing. One possibility would be to have an, the ionic tags, but also selectively cleave them in an orthogonal fashion. So you will have everything protected and then do in block couplings and, and, and in that way assemble longer oligonucleotides. Finally, I have just two more slides, and that is that um, tremendous development uh, in the synthesis of a stereogenic, uh, uh, isomerically pure uh, phosphate modified oligonucleotides. And here on the right hand side, you, you, you've seen these different type of uh, modified uh, oligonucleotides having different functionality of the phosphate. And um, of course, WADA and Speck and George Just at McGill early on were trying to do this. And I want to encourage you to come to the chemistry session where Scott Miller is going to tell us about the use of chirophosphoric acid catalyst that will in principle one day allow us to take diastereomeric mixture of the phosphoramidides, which is what we normally use, to convert them into something that is only one stereochemistry, allowing you then to do the coupling to get only one isomeric form of the phosphide triester. And in that fashion, a particular stereoisomer using phosphorus three chemistry. Um, finally, the last slide of my talk is to tell you about Il Baran's uh, approach. Um, and there have now been two papers, the last one just published la this last week, where he has uh, 
redundancy, if I could say, of phosphor triester chemistry, what we call the P5 platform, using novel uh, nucleoside building that allows you to introduce the different type of chemistry, both phosphorodithioates that were introduced back in the days by Mark Carruthers, normal phosphates, uh, stereo-random phosphor, also stereo uh, isomerically pure and SP phosphodiesters. Um, and what is impressive, I think, about this is that you're able in the same synthesis cycle for automated DNA synthesis adapted from phosphorus 3 to phosphorus 5 and being able to introduce the three different types of phosphate link bioates shown here as well as the R phosphorophioates demonstrating this LNA DNA gap um, with and, if, and I encourage you to look at the extensive mental information that they provided to convince us that in fact this is a great approach and the kinetics of which these monomers actually couple now rival those of the phosphoramidite approach. Uh, and so it's nice to see the phosphorus three, phosphorus five, solid this potential this is in mechanochemistry as new opportunities. Is the diversity of oligonucleotides as we move forward to, to therapeutics. Um, and uh, since I am chairing this the session tomorrow, I want to encourage you to attend to every session. It'll be exciting because we're again about the chemistry of oligonucleotides as well as the recognition of RNA, small molecule, Disney, and Maureen McKay, um, a, a newcomer in the area of to tell us about new building blocks. And of course, Ionis Ontario Tech on chemically modified oligonucleotides as well as chemistry that allows us to push delivery to the next. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention and happy to answer questions when the time comes. I said very great presentation uh, over everything that happens. And uh, I remember when I started making oligonucleotides with Bernard Lebleu in Montpellier in 1985, everybody was saying, oh, that's stupid, it will never work. That's where we are. Um, I don't see any question of the chat. Uh, in line with what we now have a product like Inclisiran, Legview, that has been approved in Europe, and we expect that to be approved in the United States also. Future, we have an oligonucleotide that may require the production of tons of those of this SI RNA conjugated to Galnac. So clearly, we can see that making tons of oligonucleotide using the current solid phase synthesis in fixed factor could be uh, a bird requiring a lot of uh, batches after the other. In your view, and something that hasn't been addressed during this presentation, this presentation and the previous one, we also have the new company created by Livingstone coming from uh, Imperial College London with this, um, special field mix between solid phase and uh, some kind of a liquid phase synthesis. How do you see this new technology as a possibility to break the barrier of 1.6 more synthesis to something like for peptides, for instance, reaction is uh, in 5,000 liter reactors to make much larger batch. Right. So it's an excellent question. And I think time will tell as a chemist, and, 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 and of course you appreciate this, um, it's going to take some time of development. I mean, we know that in principle it could do so, but let's not forget that uh, solid phase synthesis, large scale that is being, it took quite a bit of 
um, development as well. Even if the platform that was able to couple nucleotides in a very efficient way. So I think the engineering aspect is also going to be, uh, even in the mechanical chemistry area, uh, the good thing there is that there is history of using twin extrusion instruments that have been able to make uh, um, molecules in, in very large scales, but how is that going to be adapted? Do that. So, so I I think that um, those are all very um, uh, alternatives to synthesis. I think solid phase synthesis is there to stay for quite a while. Uh, however, as you mentioned, as we go to the uh, large large I think solution phase synthesis is very attractive. Remember, once you sequence of an oligonucleotide, you could make trimers of those mm -hmm. sequence. You don't need the 64 different trimers to be made. And then that allows you then to do these block couplings because block couplings probably are gonna be necessary. Well, your failure sequences are easily separated, um, but also because you could make these trimers at very high yields. So the answer is we will be encouraged though by the process that you, you've mentioned. Um, I need to learn a little bit more about it, but I know that it's going to take uh, not just, but also the who does this assembly and engineering. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. I think we have to move on now to Richard Geary's presentation, and we will go back to the manner that just popped up on the on the chat during okay. the Q and A. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you again, and uh, we now have two hundred and fifty-six people. That is pretty impressive for a workshop Sunday morning on the East Coast. Um, so now it's time for Richard. Thanks. Well, I'm certainly pleased to be able to present an Ionis view on antisense drug development for you today. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation and the opportunity to present. You know, right up front, everything we do uh, in development is colored by our science, the medicines, and the patients. So we'll start there. I hope at the end of this talk, you'll take home these learning objectives, understanding the basics, special efficiencies, and the importance of having a strategic pipeline. Finally, you'll be hopefully also further value uh, the research to development connection, patient-centric drug development, and how important organization efficiency is to the development of new medicines. Okay, so the basics. Right up front <clears throat> is the patient's need, where there is really no answer today and understanding how targeting RNA precisely may allow us to treat their disease in a unique and potentially breakthrough manner. Passion for treating unmet needs for patients breeds success. Listed here are our three marketed antisense medicines today, all in rare disease. Spinraza in spinal muscular atrophy, Tixeti, in polyneuropathy, in hereditary ATTR, and Waylivra in familial calomicronemia syndrome. While on this slide, um, I've, I've put really a very simplistic view. Our goal is proving safe and effective treatment through the clinical trial process, bringing together patients doctors, and regulatory agencies to give us input is certainly key, but not simple and never straightforward. At IONIS, the pipeline is broad in multiple therapeutic areas, including cardiovascular, metabolic, severe and rare diseases, including neurological disorders and cancer. Starting with research and discovery. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the traditional approach 
how development, not to get ahead of myself, moves through three phases. Today, we will find many forms that are different, and the health authorities are encouraging innovative trial designs. Many of our clinical trials bypass healthy volunteer phase one, for example, and move directly into patients. Even some designs that move directly to phase three from first in man proof of biology are found in our pipeline. Several more are designed similarly uh, to this very simplified single clinical trial proof of biology to phase three, particularly in rare or ultra rare contexts. Clinical research is a process of defining the research objectives, designing the experiment to test a hypothesis, obtaining agreement with health authorities to conduct the study as designed, and initiating the study. Sounds simple, but ultimately is anything but. Starting with research and discovery, I want to talk a little bit about enhanced efficiencies that the RNA-based approach brings. Of course, in research efficiencies, and that's where it starts, means low human resources, very high brain resources, and many opportunities in yet uncharted territories to bring forward exciting development opportunities. Moving to development, development benefits that drive efficiencies are really driven by the class generic pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic and toxicology property. Further that, or add to that, the minimal preclinical to phase 2a failures due to understood pharmacokinetics and safety. And ultimately, as long as the disease targets <clears throat> are chosen wisely and registration studies fully vetted through patient, investigator, and health authorities, the rest of the way is not dissimilar to any late stage development process. The key at that point <clears throat> is certainly driven by selection of the target. There are many ancillary development studies that require attention during development, including clinical pharmacology work. Some of these are listed here on the left. However, the RNA-based platforms, many of these have been de-risked and no longer required through our close interaction with health authorities and greater understanding of the learnings from previous pro programs. So taking all of this together, these efficiencies have allowed IONIS to execute a successful business model and build a very large pipeline. Today, we combine the prolific drug discovery platform with a large strategically built pipeline that we'll talk about next that allows us to be in the enviable position to select the best path forward for each of our medicines. We may choose to commercialize ourselves, currently focusing that effort in neuro and cardio medicines, or we may choose to partner in which assets to partner and how and when. So when you think about strategic build uh, of a development pipeline, at the forefront of our strategically built ASO pipelines uh, is rapidly introducing new chemical technologies into clinical testing. We're focused on high value opportunities, secondly, that have the potential therapy. Third, we're to identify multiple genetic targets and pathways to treat ALS, NASH, and cardiovascular disease, for example. And finally, we balance the pipeline of now 49 antisense medicines to treat rare, mid-size, and large populations. RNA targeting facilitates a broad opportunity in multiple therapeutic arenas. Careful selection of targets, 
and technologies, as we've discussed, that focus on unmet need is a clear requirement. We aim to treat in diseases where a breakthrough could transform therapy. So one example of a rapidly moving of, of rapidly moving advances in technology into clinical development is our Galnac Lyca technology, precisely targeting hepatocytes in the liver. These figures describe the engagement of the modification with cell uptake receptors in the liver. The Lyca technology is now expanding to other tissues and organs intended to do what we've seen with the Galnac Lyca precisely deliver our antisense medicines that have now demonstrated increases in potency, less frequent dosing, and safety supporting advanced testing into phase three today for many of these compounds. This graphic now published exhibits the clinical improvement in potency shown for multiple Galnac Lycus. Note also the similarity from target to target and sequence to sequence that allows efficient amortization from medicine to medicine. It is this amortization, whether conjugated or unconjugated, that allows us to rapidly bring molecules forward, sometimes even bypassing phase one. Today, we have 50 medicines targeting liver in our pipeline progressing through the various stages of development as shown here with multiple indications confirming our commitment to build a strategic pipeline. So another example of this uh, is targeting multiple genetic targets and pathways, for example, in ALS. Essentially surrounds ALS as a surrounding ALS as a strategic goal shown here. Both rare hereditary forms and disease and ultimately all forms of ALS are being targeted. Ultimately, medicines into late stage development, phase three. We currently have five medicines and seven indications with rare mid-size and very large populations that have progressed into regulatory filing clinical trials. As the pipeline progresses, our vision is to move more than 12 through approval through 2026. And this goal, you know, drives the pipeline decisions with a visionary and strategic focus. At the center of development, is the project team. Uh, early in the process, let's say I may have, oh yes, and, and I wanted also to of course indicate that the, there are many challenges and opportunities associated with developing a broad pipeline like this. Some of those are listed here and they include unplanned issues like COVID but they also uh, include things that we understand well, the need for advocacy in ultra, particularly ultra orphan diseases. And sometimes those don't exist and need to be built. Natural history studies that sometimes don't exist, but needs to be, need to be built and they need to be built early in development. One of my personal critical goals that I, jump the gun a little bit to talk about, it's applied to, to, to development, was to ensure a seamless transition from discovery to development by integrating research and development across the continuum of the development timelines. So what does that look like in the real world application? And when does that happen? So at the center of development is the project team that I wanted to talk to you about. Early in the process, the R2D te te teams, what we call R2D teams, are formed once a target is sanctioned and certainly well before a human drug con candidate has been identified. There are some key issues included in full integration, 
across teams, enabling bench to bedside translation with managed and expedited uh, commitments. Process involves a timeline that generally runs for a couple of years from target sanction to an IND or equivalent submission. Various activities are listed here at each stage with the full research and ultimate development teams being fully formed by the time of IND or equivalent submission. R to D interactions and activities continue to grow and evolve. Certainly there are many additional elements in the rare and ultra rare conditions. And these include, but are not limited to developing a strong biomarker program, for example, early development uh, and involvement of patients, understanding the patient journey, advocacy groups, and sometimes designing and initiating natural history studies. Key elements of the development plan are shown here and cover the important thinking that must happen before even the first patient is dosed. Starting here with the target product profiles, both minimal and optimal, all the way down to uh, the tactical components of timelines and high level budgets and a line of sight to phase three filing. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about patient-centric drug development. What does it mean to be patient-centric? The FDA guidance on patient-centric defines the science as constantly evolving. And while that is certainly true, there are certain elements listed on this slide that position the thinking of the team that needs to be incorporated in development of the clinical protocols. So those include understanding the patient journey and then all the way to clinical meaningfulness and understanding significance of clinical endpoints. And they may be understanding most bothersome symptoms for patients in heterogeneous diseases that may be quite different from patient to patient. And how does one put that together into a significant clinical endpoint? So the interaction with the patient and understanding the disease is critical to spread through development strategies that lead to patient access to optimize the success of any program. It's important that approval is not the end and it isn't access. So we have to develop products from the beginning with the end goal in mind. And the end goal is patient access. The gray bar below accentuates the benefits of including patient experience as early as even basic research. Finally, allow me a moment to reflect on organization efficiencies that I believe grease the skid, so to speak, for development. A flat organization with simplified decision-making processes is essential. So at IONIS, we've designed a flat organization without hierarchical constrictions. Governance at the highest level for the most important high level decisions are facilitated in two management committees and only two, RMC and DMC listed here on the left. Beyond that, the decision making is pushed down and decentralized to the franchise and project team leadership, out of committees, out of groupthink and to our leaders. As we conclude today, I hope about drug development and how we accomplish this complex activity at IONIS. Perhaps some of the learning objectives that I showed in one of the first slides are one you can look, look back on and see whether you've picked up some, some, some items 
uh, that you didn't know before. It certainly takes a village to develop a medicine. All the pieces are important, must be highly skilled, but ultimately the central drive that brings it all together is greater than the sum of the parts. With perseverance and passion, we will continue to develop meaningful and breakthrough products to change lives for the better. It is, in my experience, the best why we exist, helping hurting people get better. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Richard, for this nice presentation as always. Uh, and thank all the presenters for the four presentations we have got this morning. Thank you also for the currently 250 people listening to this workshop today. That's again, a great achievement for this organization. Uh, there are no real new questions here, but to start first with a, a question to about this uh, process. Uh, you have presented information about the validation of those analytical methods, but we also have the validation of the manufacturing process. And I would like you to tell us a little bit about uh, how long it takes to do all those validations. So our listeners who are not very familiar with that already can have an idea that it's not something that in a few weeks or even in a few months but that takes so people starting their first oligonucleotide development have a good idea about how long it takes to do that and uh, after heidi uh, richard is also uh, we would be happy to hear from him based on the Ionis experience in doing that as they did that many times already. Thank you, Mark. Uh, that is an important question and often um, misunderstood. We are a contract manufacturing organization. And as I mentioned in my the focus on the cycle is of great importance to understand the impurity profile of your oligonucleotides and all of the raw materials that go into building the oligos, uh, not only for the drug substance, um, to consider the drug product and its stability profile. Keeping all of that in mind, from start to finish, you really need to look at the development life cycle of several years, uh, especially if you're from, uh, research phase all the way through uh, from tox batch and phase one be in full validation of your methods and your process. Um, the final steps of a process validation, it can take a couple of years. Uh, you need to verify many things about the reproducibility and get everything in place from supply chain through methods and supporting uh, information. All of that needs to be documented from method standpoint that includes history, the qualification of your methods, validation, uh, sometimes up to a year in length just for the method validation portion. Uh, and then you need those methods successfully transfer for use into the quality control environment. Our, and our that is a key for the regulatory uh, filing expectations. Thank you, Heidi. I, I uh, have to concur that this always takes longer than we sometimes hope it will. And so uh, even at uh, the management of companies, this isn't well understood. So start on and uh, all of the work that needs to be done for CMC is incredibly important. I can just uh, how important it is to get that started. And usually that uh, sometime when you're in phase two, uh, looking at possibly launching a phase three, you've got to get going. You've got a few years ahead of you of very busy work. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Another question that has been asked on the chat is about what is an acceptable purity? Not only for short oligonucleotides like ASOs or strands of an SIR, uh, Mano also asked about uh, purity standard for the guide for CRISPR or messenger RNA. And uh, my first comment is that there is still no guidance for such thing. Um, ICHQ3, ICHQ6 are not applicable to biotides so far. There's been some initial directive about the purity of the peptides, but not yet for the oligonucleotides. And so my first comment to the the attendees to this workshop would be if you have to if you want to have a good idea about uh, those aspects of the short oligonucleotides go back to the paper by Capaldi et al in 2017 in nucleic acid technology by the way the OTS official journal and you will have a really deep analysis but now if uh, Richard and uh, if you could comment a little bit, if you know a little bit about uh, what about the longer oligonucleotide like the GD, gRNA or the messenger RNA, I think it would be helpful for our attendees to, to, to hear, to listen to your experience in that matter. Um. Heidi, do you want to go first or do you want me to comment on it? Sure. Uh, from an analytical perspective, um, we are looking at the impurities and we do the perspective of reporting of impurities at 0.1% is our typical target. Our methods do go lower as needed. Uh, the impurity program of exceptional importance to uh, understand what's happening throughout the process and into your final product. Uh, the actual final purity is, as Mark noted, uh, a little bit under um, a guidance black hole. Uh, we justify our specifications with multiple points of view. So from a process standpoint, as well as from an analytical standpoint and a batch history uh, standpoint. So those things feed into your uh, regulatory strategy. Yeah, thank you, Heidi. And I can maybe speak from a time that I think regulators what more importantly is matching the impurity profiling of the batch which is going into animals versus the batch which is going into patients. Or that there are no new impurities at any batch which were not there in the non-GMP batch. And also uh, for the identities, the level of impurities can be higher in the GMP batch than the ones which were identified in the non-GMP. So that's very, very important because in cases where your process changed or now you have a new impurity, you will have to run talk studies with those where the new impurity is find. And that's a humongous amount of work that makes the pro program very expensive. So I think this is something to look for so that you have the consistency in the you're using to prepare your non-GMP batch versus the GMP batch. That's certainly the case. Um, and the importance of the toxic is, is really important. I don't want to um, dismiss that. In fact, that was the point I was, I was going to also make. Um, also, as you work through and you have new batches and you have full and, and you process, you may come across a new impurity. And then there's a lot to be done to understand what that impurity is and what may be the cause of that impurity, whether that's a starting. There's, there's a ton of work that needs to get done. And then for uh, actually clarifying the safety of that impurity, it is once again going back to the toxic uh, component. So this is this is not a bit of, of work. 
It's uh, we we set up entire uh, committees that uh, follow these <laughs> these analytical efforts and and uh, keep up with exactly what's going on with the product as in development. Yeah, and to summarize this uh, take home message, uh, when I start developing a new project with any of my clients, I try to tell them don't aim at too much purity at the early stage. Anything between 85 and 90% is totally acceptable, provided this impurity profile gives very clean profile in the animal studies. And then progressively improve as you understand your process much and you improve your manufacturing and purification process. At the end of the day, we have a very clear message coming from authorities in this public document that EMA published together with the approval of uh, Inclusiran. This oligonucleotide doesn't have 97% purity, at least for the single strands. And uh, some, uh, some limits for some impurities are pretty high, two, three, four, five percent. And that has been accepted. All the EMA said is, we invite you to reduce the level of those impurities from the top of my head, 18 batches to achieve that. So as, long as all the tox data coming from and clinical trials in patients are clean. The level of impurity is definitely not a, a big con Again, as long as you have no tox issue, the main repeated in almost every talk I've heard about regulators meetings is, as Mina said, no sudden impurity in a significant amount and no batch to batch is definitely the most important criteria that FDA and EMA will look at when they will review all those documents. Um, then um, there is a question about the backbone uh, POPS mixes, a, a few attendees asking about stereo pure PS. And then another question about uh, what is best for the product you to, to develop. So this, this last question is, uh, I think, effect incredibly broad, uh, but we have companies like Al Nylam, all they are doing is we have companies like uh, making ASO so far, price us some time, but uh, so what is your, your view at you, the Richard about is, is it any kind of a way to say for those type of diseases, we need it's better to have an SI RNA and for other type of diseases, it's better to have an ASO, except that maybe we can agree that for exon skipping, there is no reason to use an SI RNA, that uh, uh, ASO will always be. Richard, do you want to start? Yeah, I may have a biased opinion, but. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we want is the best product for each, each disease or each target. And I, I can tell you that um, it is probably best to have an insight into uh, all of the technologies and how best to go after a particular uh, target. Some targets because they're nuclear in, in it may be uh, even prefer uh, an ASO. So our 
greatly expressed in the cytoplasm, uh, it may be that you'll get a better uh, response with, uh, with, so it's best to take the target into consideration, probably more than the disease, Mark. It's probably more the target and the biology and really under and also distribution. So uh, understanding where these molecules can go and, and, and are best achieved uh, safely. So that's, that's would be my answer. We look at each of our research projects. So if I may, I think my perspective is actually slightly different. And as I was preparing my slides, looked at all the, the pipeline of the companies working in antisense and asset in a field. And what I noticed that, um, you know, let's divide the diseases into the um, toxic gain of function and then loss of function. Let's look at the modalities where we're going. Right, and if you look at the industry at this point, antisense oligonucleotides now have been working on gain of function diseases right, by RNAsH mechanism, as well as loss of function diseases by splicing mechanism or RNAsH mechanism. Right, those have harnessed it seems both sRNA directly, they are working only on toxic gain of function diseases, unless you work on some pathways where, you know, deactivating one gene is actually, you know, restoration of some other protein, but I haven't seen that example yet. So unless some metabolic pathways, sRNAs are only going to be uh, focusing on the toxic gain. And that's where I'm, you know, the industry where, where they are going. And I think we have yet to find examples more crisscross, right? Um, otherwise, you know, look at TTR, how SIRNA and antisense both have been successful, but then from a scientific perspective, one has to look at not just distribution, but the catalytic of these mechanism. And far, at least there is no example I have seen where ASOs have beaten the catalytic activity of SIRNA. Right, disease where you after knocking down a, a gene, uh, we have yet to see how the doses are going to match using um, for AS, ASO, even using LNAC versus. Uh, and I wish there was a fair comparison when you look at you know Tercel and um, you know Galnac conjugated the Givalari drug. A fair comparison 284 milligram ASO drug versus you know 0.3 milligram because ASO doesn't have a galnac there. But um, I think it's very clear how these catalytic activities of the mechanisms are dictating the dosing and the frequency in the clinic. So that's what actually we'll have to look for when we are thinking about which use for what indication. Uh question from Michael Nasiak that is, if I summarize this question, is all about uh, what we call now N of 1, because uh, he's asking about, uh, it could be a business slash medical model to structure drugs for specific people. And for me, drugs for specific people is basically N of 1. That means those uh, drugs that would address a disease that has only one patient identified in the world. For example, we have today that has been the most uh, published one. But now we have a lot of including this foundation and Lorem that was f founded by the of Ionis uh, to focus on the development of those N of one product. So, start. You can comment a little bit on this model to structure drugs for specific people. Uh, how you see that close that you are to the N. Lauren and uh, uh, this group in Carlsbad doing treatment for patients in this situation. 
Yeah, just to be clear, the foundation, of course, is independent of the company. Yeah. So um, many of us are volunteers, mm -hmm. put it that way, and uh, are involved in, in some activities. The Enlorum approach, which of course is the concept that there are very, very rare diseases out there that are caused by unique mutations in a gene, a, and it may be a, a unique gene in the process of their disease. And therefore, the ability to um, develop an antisense for that gene, for that mutation, is And so where it is deemed biologically possible to do so, um, the Enlorum group then, with their uh, technology group makes a decision on whether they can make a, a an antisense compound for that specific person and individual disease. So that's pretty exciting. And I think we're all uh, very hopeful that that will be able to even be replicated and, and um, you know, made broad for individual patients who have a very unique and so we're uh, moving on and, um, of course, very excited about. And many, uh, as I understand it, there are uh, companies that are offering in-kind support on the development of these, including the FDA, who has even put out a draft uh, guidance uh, for this approach. Thank you. As Anamika wrote on the, the chat, there is a session on one tomorrow as well. So if you want to talk about those end of one approach, watch this session tomorrow during regular OTS meeting. Um, I'm going through the, the questions, trying to see if there is any Otherwise, 12 and uh, it's the break for the session. So I think we will and let people prepare for the next session. Again, I would like to thank all the presenters that accepted my invitation to this workshop. Thank you very much. And uh, it could be my last workshop after having done that a uh, few years, it's time to to let younger people take over and continue that. Uh, it's been a great pleasure for me to push for having this educational session in the DOTS meeting. I think we started that in 2018 and uh, it's been very, very successful. And uh, I'm sure that with uh, all the wonderful people we now have in the, in, in the OTS, it will not be difficult to continue that very nicely and uh, to continue that that is a great organization. Thank you very much.